Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two-player game, Splendor Duel, designed by Marc Andre and Bruno Catala, and published by Space Cowboys, who helped sponsor this video. Based on the original best-selling Splendor, here you'll also be the head of a guild of jewelers trying to rise in fame and fortune, but this title has been designed to create a unique experience for just two players. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, put this game board in the center of the play area, and then mix these tokens into the included bag. Then you'll draw them out randomly to fill in each space of the board, starting in the center and then falling in the direction of the arrowed path that leads from it so that it looks something like this when you're done. The tokens are made up of gold pieces that look like this and pearls which have a pink border. The rest are gems which come in five different colors. So again, we have gold, pearls, and gems. Beside the board, set these three privilege scrolls and then find the royal cards, which have this back, and set them in a face-up row nearby. Their order doesn't matter. Now find and sort the remaining cards into three piles based on their backs and give each of them a good shuffle. Their dots indicate which level each deck represents. Level 1, 2, and 3. Arrange them so they're ordered with level 1 on the bottom all the way up to level 3, and then reveal three level 3 cards into a row beside its deck. Then four cards from level 2, and finally five cards from the first level, creating a pyramid shape. At the top of that pyramid, then set this victory tile. Finally, pick someone randomly to be the first player, and then have their opponent take any one of these privileged scrolls. And that's the setup. In Splendor Duel, you and the other player will be competing to collect valuable gems, gold, and pearls in order to craft jewels for powerful members of the community. Be the first to satisfy one of the game's three possible victory conditions, and you'll win. Now, the conditions won't make a lot of sense yet, so we'll go over them after we've learned some more of the rules. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player and then going back and forth until somebody wins. On your turn, you first choose whether to perform either, both, or none of the optional actions that are listed here. And we'll start with the first one, spending one privilege. Privileges are these scroll tokens, and the opponent to the first player begins the game with one. You'll also be able to gain these in other ways during the game, so let's assume for a moment that we had two of these from previous turns. To use a privilege during this optional action step, you return as many as you like back to the space for them above the board, and for each one returned, you take any one token from the board except for gold, which you'll remember are these tokens. Any tokens you collect must be placed in front of you and clearly visible to your opponent at all times, and it's recommended that you group them by color over the course of the game. So if I collected another blue token, I might put it here. I'm just going to return these tokens back to the board for now, but that is one of the optional actions. And remember, when you perform it, you may return any number of privilege tokens you may have all at once, taking a token for each. But there's also another optional action you can take along with, or instead of this, and it's known as replenishing the game board. Over the course of the game, as tokens are collected from the board, it will start to empty. And at some point, you may wish to replenish the board to have better options to pick from. To take this action, there must be some tokens in the bag, and we'll see how tokens end up here a little later, but if there are any, you now mix the tokens and draw them randomly to fill in the empty spaces of the board, starting from the center and following the arrowed path that we saw earlier, adding them in that order. And you'll keep doing this one space at a time until the bag is empty. This is the symbol for replenishing the board, and as it reminds us here, anytime a player does this, their opponent collects one of these privilege scrolls. During the game, if a player is ever owed a privilege scroll and there are none left by the board, they instead take one from their opponent. On the other hand, if a player is owed a scroll, but they already have all three of them, then nothing happens. And those are the optional actions. Use privileges and, or, replenish the game board. And because they're optional, you can choose to skip this step entirely if you want. But either way, you must now pick one of the three possible mandatory actions, which are listed here on the back of the rulebook. And we'll discuss each of these actions now, starting with taking up to three tokens. 
When performing this action, you may never take any of the gold pieces, but may collect up to three gem and or pearl tokens that are in an adjacent, unbroken, horizontal, vertical, or diagonal line. So that means I could take these three, or these three, or these three, or these three, or these three, and so on. There's many examples here of tokens that I could take. And usually, you'll want to take three at a time, but later in the game, as fewer tokens remain, you may have to take fewer to get the ones you really want. For example, if I wanted a pearl, and the board looked like this, I might just take this single token, since it's the only pearl left to collect. Now remember, when you're taking up to three tokens, the line must be straight and unbroken. So I couldn't take these three or even these two because there's a space between them. I also couldn't collect these three red because you can't take a gold piece with this action and there's one breaking up this group. Here's something else to keep in mind. If you ever collect three gems of the same color, or two pearls at the same time. Your opponent gains a privilege, which you're reminded of in these two squares at the top of the board. This represents collecting two pearls, and this represents collecting three gems of the same color. So, one of the possible mandatory actions that you can take on your turn is to collect up to three tokens from the board and place them in front of you. Or, you may instead perform the take one gold and reserve one jewel card action. To do this, first take any one gold token from the board, but if there were no gold tokens on the board, then you could not perform this action. After, take any one face-up jewel card of your choice from the display, or you may draw the top card of any one of the three decks. If you take a face-up card, immediately replace it with a new one drawn from the deck of its row. If its deck is empty, then the card is not replaced. Taking a card like this is called reserving it, and cards you've reserved are now kept hidden from your opponent. So hold it in your hand, or set it face down in front of you. Either way, you can always examine your own reserved cards anytime you like. Just keep in mind, you can never have more than three reserved at a time. So if you already had three, then you couldn't take this action. Now, we'll see why you might want to reserve cards in a moment, but now let's learn about the final mandatory action you may instead take on your turn, purchasing one jewel card. Here, you choose any one face-up card in the display, or any one card you had previously reserved. If you're picking a reserved card, you would reveal it now. But either way, you then pay the cost shown here in the bottom left-hand corner of the card you've picked. The cost represents the number and types of tokens you must pay from the ones you've collected in front of you. So in this case, we need to pay two green and two red gems along with one pearl. However, any gold tokens you may have are wild and each can be used in place of any one gem or pearl token you ever need to pay. So for example, to purchase this jewel card, I might pay these two green gems, one red gem and a gold to cover the other red gem cost, and then one pearl. And any tokens that you pay with are placed into the bag. With the jewel purchased, place it face up in front of you. And as you gain more of them, organize them by color, overlapping matching colored jewels like this, ensuring that their tops are clearly visible. Many jewel cards you purchase will provide you with a permanent bonus gem, which is shown in this area. When purchasing future jewels, you can reduce their cost by the matching bonuses on cards you'd purchased previously. For example, to buy this, I'd need five blue and two green gems. If these were the cards I'd purchased previously, I'll always be able to reduce blue gem costs by three because I have three blue bonuses here. That means I only have to pay two blue tokens. And then these reduce the green gem cost to zero. So I don't have to pay any green gem tokens for those. In fact, if I had had these two cards in play already as well, I could purchase this jewel without paying any tokens. Either way, I now add this to my display. And you'll notice this one card shows two gems. So all on its own, it reduces future white gem costs I might have to pay by two. And since it's paired with this one, it reduces them by three. Just note, there are no cards that provide a pearl bonus in their corner. So any pearl costs, you'll always have to pay with a token. As you can see, the more jewels you purchase and have face up in front of you, the easier it will be to buy other cards in the future. 
After you purchase a jewel from the display, replace it with a new one from its related deck. But don't forget, instead of purchasing from the display, you can instead purchase a jewel that you had previously reserved. If you are curious about why you might reserve a card in the first place, well, first, it's the only way to get a gold token, and as we saw, gold can be used in place of any gem or pearl token cost. But also, reserving a card ensures your opponent can't purchase it. For example, I might want this jewel, but maybe I can't afford it right now. If I knew that my opponent could afford it and might take it on their turn, I may reserve it to ensure they can't and to guarantee I'll be able to buy it when I'm ready. So we now know the benefit of reserving and purchasing jewels, but there are some other benefits we should discuss as well. If a card you've purchased also shows a symbol in this area, you resolve it after adding it to your display. So let's go through how each of these symbols work. Playing a card with this symbol lets you take another full turn right after your current turn ends, which means being able to perform a number of optional actions and then a mandatory action. This ability lets you take any one token from the board matching this card's color. So playing this would let us take a black gem. Now if there were no black gems left on the board, you would instead ignore this effect. Resolving this ability gains you one privilege, and remember, if none are available in the supply, you take one from your opponent if they have any. This symbol means you now take any one gem or pearl token from your opponent. However, you cannot take gold from them, and if they have no tokens to take, you just ignore this effect. To understand this next symbol, I think it would help if we looked at an actual example. A card with this ability does not have a normal colored gem in the corner here. Instead, when you gain one of these, you must place it so it overlaps another jewel card that does show one of the regular gem types. This card then counts as another gem of that type. So now we can reduce future green costs by one, two, three. Just know, once you add one of these cards to a column, it must stay there for the rest of the game. Also note, you can place more than one of these cards in the same column. However, if you didn't have any jewels in front of you that show gems in their corner, then you could not purchase a card with this ability. Some cards may also have prestige points here, and we'll learn about those in a moment, but others may have crown symbols. As soon as you have three crowns showing across any combination of your face-up cards, you then pick one of these royals that were set beside the board during the setup and collect it. These have prestige points and may also have an ability for you to resolve when you collect them. As soon as you have at least six crowns showing on the cards you've collected, you get to take a second royal from beside the board. Taking a royal is not an action. It just automatically happens once you've collected three crowns, and then again when you have six. And those are all of the mandatory actions. Take up to three tokens in a row from the board, or take one gold token and reserve a jewel card, or purchase one jewel card. And you must take one of those actions on your turn. If you ever can't take any of them, then you must perform the optional replenish the game board action at the beginning of your turn so that the board is filled with tokens from the bag, which will then allow you to perform a mandatory action. Once you've completed your mandatory action, count the total number of gems, pearls, and gold tokens you have in front of you. Now you can have any number of tokens during your turn, but if you have more than 10 of them at the end of your turn, you must discard tokens back to the bag until you're back down to 10. The very last step of your turn is to check to see if you've satisfied any one of the three possible victory conditions that are showing on this victory tile. And we'll go over these in just a moment, but after your first turn, you certainly won't have fulfilled any of these yet, so then the next player will take their turn. And turns will go back and forth like this until the end of a player's turn where they have satisfied one of these three conditions. So let's see how these work. You win the game if at the end of your turn you ever have a total of 20 or more prestige points across all of the cards face up in front of you. Alternatively, you also win if you have 10 or more crowns on the cards in front of you. And lastly, you also win if you have 10 or more prestige on cards that all share the same color, keeping in mind that cards with this symbol count as their related color as well. In all of these cases, you do not include any of the cards in your reserve towards the victory conditions, but they don't count against them either. 
As soon as you satisfy any one of the three victory conditions at the end of your turn, the game ends and you're declared the winner. And if you enjoyed Splendor Duel, you can also pick up Splendor, which can handle up to four players and has its own unique rules. We have a tutorial for that, which I'll also link to in the description of this video. But otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Splendor Duel. And if you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.